Hello, uh, good evening and good morning. This is Deko Katsumata of JCIE. Uh, thank you very much for joining for this webinar. I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Akio Okawara, who will be the president of JCIE to uh, make a brief remarks. So Mr. Okawara, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening and uh, good morning, depending on where you are. I am Akio Kara, as introduced. I am the president of JCIE. And as the organizer of today's event, I'd like to welcome you all to the JCIE webinar, Enhancing Democratic Partnership in Asia. JCIE, since its creation in 1970, has been promoting policy dialogue and exchange programs in pursuit of peace and security in Asia and the world as a non-governmental, non-partisan foreign affairs institute. JCI organized a study group for a study group, a future of, of, future of Democracy, three years ago. And we have been conducting various programs since then to promote dialogue, to enhance understanding of this very important issue. This time, responding to the call for bringing in voices into the Summit for Democracy conversation, by the International IDEAS Global Coalition for Democracy Forum, JCI organized today's webinar to hear from experts from Asian democracies regarding the current state of democracy in their respective countries and the Asia region as a whole. Uh, this webinar is one of over 40 events uh, held today as part of the Global Democracy Coalition Forum, a virtual 24 hour event convened on the eve of the uh, Summit for Democracy to be held later this week on the 9th and 10th December. Uh, this event's aim is to galvanize a global conversation on democracy as inputs to the summit. The main messages from our speakers at our event today and all the other webinars during the day will be communicated to the organizers of the summit. I understand that our event and another event organized by India's ADR, the Association for Democratic Reform, are the only uh, ones being held in the Asian region. Therefore, today's event is important in ensuring that Asian voices will be presented to, to the summit. Uh, so now, without any further ado, I would like to hand over the proceedings to Ambassador Yukio Takasu, who will be acting as the moderator of today's discussion. Ambassador Takasu has kindly accepted to be the chair of JCI's Future of Democracy study project, and we are grateful for his great leadership in guiding our study project. Ambassador Yukio Takasu is also the special advisor to the UN Secretary General on Human Security and is a former Japanese ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, so with that, Ambassador Takasu, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kawara, for a kind introduction. Uh, my name is Yukio Takasu. I'm a chairperson of the JCI study team on the future of democracy. And I'm very much grateful to all those of you who are participating uh, despite not the most convenient time. And my own welcome also uh, to all of you. Uh, we're very much pleased to organize this uh, event uh, in the view of Summit of Democracy in conjunction with the Global Coalition for Democracy Forum, which is called for by international media. Uh, uh, the political leaders were addressed uh, in a few days time at summit later this week. However, it's also important for uh, civil society leaders uh, to express views and raise voice to empower ourselves, but also to influence decision makers. In Asia, uh, in our region, uh, backsliding democracy and the rise of authoritarian rule is noticeable, particularly since around 2013. And the further deterioration lately in Hong Kong. And once a beacon of hope, Myanmar is in disarray and Afghanistan. And in many countries in Asia, excessive restriction on freedom due to COVID-19 causes our deep concern. So democratic values such as rule of law and human rights are threatened. And particularly in the area of uh, press freedom, it's uh, very much worrisome. Uh, it is an issue of crucial importance for all of us, whether we'll be able to stop this deterioration further and the change the tide 
in this very dynamic, most dynamic region in the world. So no matter how powerful, no single country or no organization alone can succeed. We'll make it only through enhancing democratic partnership, not only government, but also civil society level. So in discussing democracy in Asia, we should be mindful of its diversity in the cultural historical background and the political economic structure. Specific way of uh, protecting human rights and freedom need to take into account such sensitivity, but at the same time, it's important to remind ourselves that human rights and the freedom of choice are universal values and inalienable to any human being. Cultural historical differences are no excuse not to protect and the human rights. So we have prepared uh, for today's discussion uh, three topics. Uh, first, how you assess the status of democracy in our region. Two, what kind of shared norms and regional partnership we should promote. Three, how to engage with non-democratic countries. On top of that, I would suggest that we should perhaps discuss also what do you expect from Summit of Democracy? What we can make suggestion or recommendation for Summit of Democracy and year for action in the course of 2022 for next summit. I hope it's in person. So this evening or this morning, we are very much fortunate to have a prominent expert on Asian democracies today. So we're going to hear first five panelists, uh, Yamini Ayar from India, Edu Nako from Philippines, Ketu Keravan from Indonesia, Maiko Ichihara from Japan, and Fun Jun Kim from South Korea. And after hearing from two commentators, uh, Lena from Indi uh, International IDEA and Manpreet of uh, National Democratic Institute, we opened the floor for this discussion. And uh, the, I'm very much hoping to hear as many views as possible and count on your cooperation. So now let's go to the first speaker panelist, uh, if I may, uh, alphabetical order. I call on Yamini Aya. Uh, she is a president and chief executive, Center for <laughs> Policy Research India. Uh, Yamini, you have a floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for that kind introduction and this important uh, preface to the conversation today. Uh, I think the very fact that we are able to cut across boundaries, timelines, uh, time zones rather, uh, geographical boundaries, time zones, and context to speak about the values of democracy and the importance of democracy in our region, uh, as well as the threats to democracy in our region, is itself a tribute to democracy um, and, and, the, uh, and the power of uh, what technology can do to bring a multitude of voices and perspectives together. But I think in celebrating this power, uh, we also must be cognizant of the many deep threats uh, that democracy faces today. Uh, the very same technology that brings us together has also been a powerful tool uh, to fundamentally undermine the practice of democracy in its everyday sense. I come from a country, India, uh, which has been widely celebrated across the globe for its resilience uh, of, democrat of democ democratic values and democratic principles. Resilience in the sense that in 1947, when the, Indi when the, <clears throat> the modern Indian nation uh, gained independence uh, and our constitutional, um, our founding fathers established our constitution committing the country to democratic principles, there was widespread skepticism about the possibility of democracy unfolding in a context of deep poverty, social stratification, and inequality, and illiteracy. In fact, in many ways, democracy was seen as almost a luxury of the rich, a luxury of countries that had gone through a structural transformation, and that collectively, or were going through rather, a structural transformation, and that collectively had arrived at values of liberty, equality, and justice. And it was upon us, the people of India, to prove to the world 
that the values of democracy can cut across multiple challenges, challenges of poverty, challenges of illiteracy, challenges of deep social stratification and inequality. And we proved uh, over these last now nearly 70 years uh, that the practice of democracy can in fact be embedded in the harshest of contexts. But democracy is more than the art of voting. And I think the lessons from India over these last 70 years, but perhaps more profoundly in the last decade, raise important questions about what the limits of democracy can be and what, how hard we need to work beyond the active practice of voting to secure democratic values in our society and in the functioning of our state and the relationship that state, the state forges with citizens. I would argue that in India, we see three critical threats to the substantive practice of democracy. And none of these threats are unique to India. I think they, in, in different ways, uh, are demonstrated across the globe. And many countries in the region, many of our neighbors are struggling with similar questions and similar challenges. The first biggest threat that comes to democracy is from the <clears throat> is, is from the active uh, 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 co complexity of the relationship between capital, private capital, and democracy. The practice of democracy requires resources across the world. And it has always played, as had, uh, electoral financing has always sat in a somewhat uneasy relationship with the values of democracy. Across the globe, the question of what does it take to effectively ensure transparent electoral financing, whilst at the same time ensuring that money doesn't guide how the practice of party politics unfolds in, the, in, in everyday democracy remains a crucial challenge. But what makes it particularly critical in the context of India is that we are seeing two very in, uh, two parallel processes. One, as capital itself, as growth itself has unfolded, social inequality and wealth, wealth inequality has become far more embedded. So it is a set of very high level monopolies that now dominate the economy. And it is those monopolies that now that also dominate our politics. So we ended up with, uh, through the process of 30 years of economic liberalization, with the unleashing of animal spirits of capitalism, but the profits of, that, uh, of those animal spirits concentrated amongst the higher end of the elites, building into our democracy, a very critical foundational crony capitalism that is hard to break. How do you make democracy representative in this context is a very, very crucial question. And in India, uh, it finds itself unfold in very intriguing ways. We struggle with the fact that a large number of our representatives actually have deep criminal records. You mentioned the Association of Democratic Reforms that is organizing uh, a, a discussion on democracy in, in, the, uh, in the context of the Democracy Summit. Well, they were one of the few civil society organizations that raised their voice in the Indian context on this coexistence of capital and democracy and criminality in politics. Again, a challenge not unique to India, but one that finds itself very sharply defined in India. The second big challenge I think that democracy confronts uh, is linked to across the globe and very profoundly in India too, perhaps a consequence of increasing social inequality, uh, a social public sphere in which uh, the rising tide of nationalism, of boundaries, starts playing a deep, deep role in how the practice of democracy unfolds. When democracy and its values of equality, justice, and liber liberty gets conflated with nationalism, which often is articulated in the form of closing of its boundaries and closing of majorities, pitting majorities against minorities, you undermine the very values and spirit of democracy. India and its neighbors had a very, very fractious, bloody evolution into modern nationhood. This, these 70 years were meant to be our years of healing. We healed somewhat, but our own democracy has become in many ways much more inward looking. In that inward looking, violence sits uneasily, but if it in very happy complementarity with democracy, creating a deep threat to democracy itself. 
a challenge which now has got even more exacerbated by the very technology that brings us together. A new kind of public sphere is evolving, a new public sphere which is deeply democratic, it also but it also allows anonymity. Its norms of operation are still to be uh, defined and determined, and in that, certain voices tend to drown out truly democratic principles, values, and voices. How do we address that? It remains a crucial threat to democracy of the future. Last and associated, what does democracy mean in the world of big data? Uh, in the world of technology in which we live, it's not just about the creation of a public sphere, it's in every act of our participation in that public sphere, we are creating data which is used to shape the nature of that public sphere. And that data has to be held somewhere. How do you bring in principles of equality, of justice, of transparency, of accountability, when the bulk of our data is held by a set of private companies somewhere very far away, or by governments who may use it in ways that undermine the very principles of democracy that we fight for? Each of these crucial threats are threats that we need to fight for, uh, understand, uh, and fight for in order to ensure that the values of democracy are preserved and that these threats become opportunities and advantages to spreading the core of what dem democratic societies are about, societies that believe in the principles of equality, of justice, of freedom, and of liberty. Collectively fighting and learning from each other as we enter uncharted ter territory for democracy across the globe is where the democracy of the future is concerned. And I'll end with just one last point since you did mention that messages have to go to the summit of democracy. I think it's very important for the large demo largest democracy in the world, the oldest democracy in the world, rather, we are, I think, the largest democracy in the world, to recognize that it plays a central ro role in the global sphere in this global sphere of governance, if there's one thing that the traumas of the last two years has taught us, it is that global governance is fundamentally undemocratic. That we today are still fighting for vaccine equality in the context of a disease that does not know any boundaries and is in fact perhaps genuinely democratic. Talk of democracy without fulfilling those principles in the, in the context of a global crisis leaves a lot to be desired for what democracy means in the globe. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Love that. Uh, next speaker, I invite uh, Professor Edna Ko. Uh, she's a prof full professor and former dean of National College of Public Administration Governance, University of the Philippines. Edna, you are professor. So, so, Madam. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Mr. Ambassador. The uh, I, I will try to limit my uh, my talk to just three points, and uh, I think I'll follow what uh, the prescription says. That there are three main points to guide in the discussion on Philippine democracy, particularly. I am an old student of uh, David Betham's uh, idea of a democracy assessment and democracy audit in the early 2000s. And following that with uh, further support from the international idea sometime in the early 2000s, uh, particularly 2005, I tried to examine democracy, unwrap it, break it down, because it's such an enveloping generic general term. And I use certain metrics and uh, parameters of defining uh, democracy, albeit limited at that point. I looked at elections. I looked at uh, citizen participation. I look at rule of law and access to justice. And I looked at the socioeconomic development, which includes poverty, uh, economic progress, and so on. Having used this as parameters of democracy in my country, in the Philippines, I tried to look back now at this point in time. And what I see is that the Philippines, just like some countries in the region, are sharing a decline, a fragility of democratic institutions. And the evidences in my country include as follows. Our chipping away of the democratic institutions, uh, for example, 
and the closing and shutting down of media network in my country, uh, including the very the biggest and the largest media network, uh, the filing of cases against uh, a media leader and personality who eventually turned out to be a recipient of the Nobel Prize uh, given to her recently, thousands of extrajudicial killings in my country, re, uh, reach enabling the country to be recorded as a, a country that is being complained at the International Criminal Court, and the exposed fragility of democratic institutions. Increasingly, the Philippines shares similarity in increasing authoritarianism in the region, the uh, weakening of institutional checks and balances, are we unhappy or happy about this development? I would say, yes, we are disturbed by the declining democracy if I go by those measures that I mentioned. But no, we, are, we continue to be happy as a country because we are hopeful that democracy is a work in progress and that many of my fellow citizens are not fully giving up on finding every means and mechanisms to question a declining democracy and put under the rule of law the questions against democracy. Let me come to the second point now. Uh, what is it that we can share with other countries? Very much so in the case of Hong Kong, in the case of Myanmar, in the case of uh, other countries in the region whose decline for Whose, whose increase for authoritarianism and the decline for the respect of civil liberties are, are, are increasing, or shall I say declining. But next year, the Philippines faces a nodal point, which is promising for democracy. We are holding a national election in 2022, and election and political parties are another measure of democracy that all of us would like to examine along with other Asian countries. Similarly, uh, we are hopeful that our citizens continue to express democratic rights through an exercise of an election for 2022. A third point, my last point, how do we engage non-democratic countries? I don't think there is such a thing as non-democratic countries if we broaden the definition of democracy because even, of, even in the case of countries which seem to be politically undemocratic, they are similarly faced, just like us, just like many other Asian countries, on the other manifestations of the power of democracy. And this democracy power is soft. It is embedded, power is embedded in the technology, which is not upfront. Power is also embedded in the threat of the climate, the environment, which is not requiring a military fight or a political fight, but just the same, we can talk in a conversation how we can reduce the impact and reduce the, the, the frequent shocks and the implications to poverty, homelessness, on population given the climate crisis, given the environmental disturbances. And I think for many countries, this is something that binds us together. Uh, whether you are democratic, so-called democratic or non-democratic, there is always a piece of conversation that threatens democracy, having access to resources, having access to natural resources. If we do not protect the environment, if we do not protect our, 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 our defenses against recurrent shocks, and if we do not protect ourselves against climate crisis. So there is much in the conversation to go on uh, within Asia, among other countries who may have different levels of democratic exercises, but nevertheless, we find the least common denominator of democracy. Thank you very much. Ambassador Takasu, you are muted. 
done it. So thank you very much. Uh, may I invite the uh, next speaker, Ketut Eravan, who is Executive Director of Institute of Peace and Democracy by Indonesia. Uh, Ketut, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, uh, the, the committee asked me to respond to the three questions, but uh, I will focusing on the two, which is uh, the, the question on how to respond to the, the non-democracies and how to create cooperation from there. Uh, and uh, for the Indonesian uh, democracies as, as situation, we can, we can discuss uh, along the way if we have still time. Uh, responding to non-democracy, reflection for cooperation. When asked to reflect uh, on the current state of global or regional democracy, the future cooperation and how to respond to non-democracy, my, my answer can, cannot be straightforward. The challenge of democracy are tremendous. Democracies are in declining. Populism is uh, in the various form uh, on the rise. The threat to climate change and uh, emerging and emergency due to pandemic uh, is uh, are so protected. The future of cooperation is in the narrow corridor. Uh, there are two choices usually made beyond uh, business as usual uh, by condoning the non-democracies or cut the relationship uh, by which is jeopardizing the activism. So uh, my, my position is uh, uh, in the middle. Uh, I call it cor narrow corridor. So uh, for sure, it needs a rejuvenation and transformation, uh, uh, but the question is how? Responding to the non-democracy demands the realization of the form of the democracy are varied. Non-democracies mean more than no existence of competition process for electing leaders, the, the limitation of rule of law, and the neglect of political rights. My point of view, uh, non-democracies cover a notion of form of unfreedom, inequality, and exclusion. Uh, for this meeting, I delved uh, uh, the aforementioned views into two reflections. A reflection on how uh, to build a social fabrics and the second on supporting activism home and abroad. My point of view uh, was, was grounded by our discussion today uh, in, 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 in Bali because we have a forum uh, about ASEAN. So reflect, uh, we reflect much more uh, beyond Indonesia because we want to see our uh, relationship with other countries uh, around the, the area. The first one is uh, uh, building the social fabrics. This is the question raised by so many participants along our interaction uh, with, with, with countries like uh, 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 Myanmar, uh, like uh, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Fiji, and others. One of the most challenging situations shaped by the non-democracy is uh, the fragmentation of the social fabrics. The practices of uh, domination, hegemony, exclusion, could fragment the society, spread distrust and ignite friction. The daily practices of politics, politicizing identity through race, religion, and ethnicity, gender, and nationality fragment the social order. Uh, for a heterogeneous society and emerging from the conflict experiences, which is some of us and uh, countries uh, faced before, uh, building social fabric are so essential and challenging. The question on, uh, uh, from our friend and partners uh, during our engagement uh, today, uh, which is asked uh, several questions. What, one is that uh, they're asking whether Indonesia can share how to create a common ground, uh, like ideology to unify and weave the nation, how the response to the historical baggage of conflicts and how the heritage of colonialization bred schism. Uh, that's a question from uh, Myanmar. Uh, some some friends from Arabic countries asking question about how Islam and nationalism can be grounded with democracy to bring unity. So social public are very structural foundation of norms, institution, and practices of democracy as possible. Uh, social public may be taken for granted in in the homogeneous uh, countries which is have not facing uh, conflict before. Uh, so uh, the, our question from uh, our respondent from Indonesia are humbling that Indonesia is still striving to nurture the nation building every day. Even we capitalize a various historical moment, we are still uh, facing some unsettled processes of 
uh, of, 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 we call it uh, social fabric weaving. So I just, I suggest uh, the international cooperation to enable the grassroots organization to interact and build solidarity and seek the common purposes in the first uh, effort to shape the emergency of the uh, uh, social fabric. The public sphere uh, should be weaving democratically. Uh, weaving from the ground uh, and views the democracy as a building uh, the culture of dialogue is our uh, main uh, suggestion. The second point, if, we, uh, if I still have time, is the reflection of how to supporting uh, activism at home and abroad. This is the question uh, raised by so many activists uh, regarding about how to respond to the non-democracy. The choices of, of cutting off uh, our relationship with the non-democracy is not good for, for activism because you uh, may be jeopardizing their, their uh, life, uh, complicating their uh, activism, and, and much more it is uh, 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 keeping them away from, from their uh, daily service to the, the public and, and uh, public legitimacy. And second one, if uh, we are uh, uh, conducting as business as usual, it will be, uh, it will be uh, condoning the non-democracy. That is not good for the civil uh, society uh, activism and the media in particular. Uh, we discuss also the issues of, of how to support the, the, the area of, of non-real, we call it, we call it virtual, because activism now is uh, uh, widening uh, the, the sphere uh, beyond, beyond real, real, uh, real reality into the virtual reality. Uh, and in the end, I can, I can suggest uh, that, that cooperation among countries uh, to support for uh, uh, building social public and supporting activism home and abroad uh, is, is, is two agenda need to be raised in the democracy summit because those are two of, uh, usually taken for granted and sometimes uh, politis, politicized so much. So uh, we need to put uh, that in democratic perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, may I now invite the uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Ichihara. Uh, who is a professor of Graduate School of Law and School of International and Public Policy in Totsubashi University and uh, co-director of our research study group. Uh, please, you have a Thank floor. You. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ambassador Takase, for the introduction. Um, I, will, I would like to talk from a Japanese standpoint, but um, let me begin with, uh, um, with a brief overview of the situation in Asia first. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Asia has been a unique region, which consists of a sub-region that preserved democratic process relatively well, namely Northeast Asia, and the sub-regions which experienced some of the worst setback in liberal democracy, namely South and South Southeast Asia. Repression for, uh, of freedom of speech, human rights of minority groups, and the rule of law continues even in democratic countries such as the Philippines and India, as um, previous speakers talked about. The coup in Myanmar overturned the election results in November 2020 and brought the country to military dictatorship once again. And of course, um, China is an unignorable actor, which weakens the norms and institutions of civil liberties and political rights. Genocidal human rights violation is taking place in Xinjiang, and Hong Kong has, has suffered from the deprivation of freedom by the national security law. China has been also trying to weaken democratic norms as well as cooperation among democratic countries with its massive influence operations around the world, disseminating propaganda, disinformation, and making cyber attacks. Taiwan has been suffering from it the most, but other countries, including Japan, have also been affected by China's subtle influence operations. China also began a campaign to distort and dilute the norms of democracy, as we see, as we can see in an article from Global Times, a CCP media on December 4th. Despite its dis disrespect for civil liberties, which is one of the core components of democracy, it now claims that China is more democratic than the United States. It is not. Together with the fact that the center of gravity in today's world is in Asia, we, the Asians, have to take serious efforts 
to revitalize and defend liberal democracy in the Asian region. Actors with momentum for democratic defense is needed for this process. And in that sense, I welcome the inclusion of Taiwan for the Democracy Summit. But that is apparently not enough. Other Northeast Asian democracies, namely Japan and South Korea, should especially be central actors for democratic defense in the region. The time has passed when Japan keeps a low profile in political relations in the region. Japan is not only a major power in Asia. Despite weakening transparency and accountability in the government, as well as increasing governmental intervention in the judiciary and media for the past 10 years, Japan is a country which has been preserving democratic norms and institutions relatively well compared to other countries. We need Japan's commitment to liberal democracy in Asia. I make three proposals. First, in order to show that Japan is not using democracy or democracy summit rhetorically and ideologically, the country should make proposals to improve the democratic processes both domestically and externally. Showing the same level of commitment to liberal democracy in Japan, in other Asian countries or elsewhere is a key to show that Japan considers liberal democracy as a universal value. Second, Japan should lead a regional approach to de democratic defense. Asia is a rare region which does not have an effective regional mechanism for the protection of human rights and democracy. On the other hand, Asia is a region where regional mechanism is most needed in the world, given the strong emphasis remaining on the sovereignty norms. Asian actors are more relaxed with multilateral approaches to democratic defense and support rather than bilateral approaches. That is why countries such as Japan and India have been major donors for the United Nations Democracy Fund, for example. Japan can take a leadership to launch an Asian version of the European Endowment for Democracy, for example. Third, the Japanese government should involve the civil society, namely academics, lawyers, journalists, and activists in the implementation phase for the next one year. Normalizing the presence of third party oversight is crucial for democratic governance. And this will also provide a model for how to maintain transparency and accountability which are core norms of good governance that other Asian countries also accept. Authoritarian powers are increasingly exerting to, uh, exerting to hybrid warfare where they attack the norms and institutions of liberal democracy in order to destabilize democratic societies before conducting military attacks. Thus, defense and restoration of democracy is badly needed for international security as well and a wide range of middle power countries cooperation is crucial for its success. Japan must stand up and stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me invite uh, the next professor, Kim Jung Kim, uh, who is a professor of department of political science in Korea University. We are pleased to have you, please. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I study international norms uh, and then I study international human rights and then US-China relations. Uh, so my uh, discussion would be particularly focused on the rise of the authoritarian China. So I'll address all three questions. The question number one, the challenges uh, for the democracies in the region. I want to raise the three points about the authoritarian threat from China. The first, the China finds its legitimacy mainly from its economic achievement. Therefore, the many democracies uh, uh, suffering uh, economic hardship like countries in ASEAN and then countries with a high levels of trade dependence on China like South Korea are especially vulnerable. So I think that's the first premise that we have to start with. And second, the China for a long time uh, claimed relativism uh, it echoes with many countries in the region, especially ASEAN, uh, which emphasized relativism and non-interference uh, uh, and also the Asian value. One key difference is that the previously it was defensive one for Chinese, uh, but now it's more offensive and much more sophisticated. Two recent documents uh, this week, released this week, one on the Chinese democracy and then the other on the democracy on the US, 
uh, is a clear example of the offensive from China. The third, the China is taking advantage of the failure of the US and other democracies, especially a gap between the words and deeds, and then double standards, uh, interest-driven, and then selective application of values. The China's recent, recent offensive against the democracy, human rights, and multilateralism all hinges upon uh, the failure and then the faltering of the democracies. So question number two, how to build a democratic partnership in the region? From this understanding, I suggest the two strategies for the democracies in Asia. The first, the pro-democracy and not anti-China or the anti-authoritarian measure. Due to China's strategy, the anti-China or the anti-authoritarian policy can always and easily backfire. So examples are what happened to Australia. The better way is to always to focus on pro-democracy initiatives. This means working together with other democracies and even raising voices against the other democracies' missteps and faltering if needed. The US under Trump or the deteriorating uh, democracies in Eastern Europe is a clear example. No democracies are perfect. The checks and balance is not only the domestic principle for democracies, but also should happen across borders. The second, enhance the mutual understanding of other democracies in the region. The democracies in Asia should communicate with each other and then learn from each other how they are dealing with an authoritarian threat from China. The recent experience shows that many countries in the region suffer a similar offensive from China. Australia, uh, Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines. Measures include a, you know, the uh, misinformation or the infiltration, the punitive uh, sanctions, and so on. However, these experiences and strategies are not effectively shared among the Asian democracies. I'm really glad that we have this uh, session, which is a rare opportunity for scholars and activists and practitioners to share what we think of the recent challenges to the democracy. So lastly, the question number three, how to engage with non-democratic countries. I again suggest two strategies. The first, multilateral rather than the bilateral interactions against China. For measures such as raising concerns over Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Tibet, or transparent COVID-19 investigation, multilateral actions are always better uh, than the bilateral ones. China, which is highly combative against the individual countries, tend to be silent when the multiple countries raise the issues together. However, there is a catch. So far, it was mainly the G7 countries who raised these concerns, but I think the more Asian countries should be involved. It is not only against China, but also in case of the Myanmar juntas. In most recent joint statement uh, against the military juntas, only the Korea and the East Timor were the only Asian countries who co-signed the statements along with the EU and the US. And second strategy is state and civil society in coordination. The similarly, especially for the Asian democracies, which has a very strong economic ties with China, they should work together with active civil society actors to promote democratic values and human rights. The recent poll from Korea shows that the concern over Chinese human rights violations in Hong Kong and Xinjiang is very high in Korea. However, the government is too cautious to raise the voice due to its economic vulnerabilities and then also the input from the many inter stakeholders and the interest groups. The solution could be uh, the government should let the civil society lead on these issues about uh, addressing the, uh, the human rights issues in China uh, with a tacit but strong support. So I'll stop here and discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We have heard a full panelist presentation, which are extremely rich. May I invite uh, two commentators one by one? First, uh, from India, yeah, India. Lina Likrataman, who is Director of Asia in the Pacific region. Uh, Lina, you have a floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Takasu, and thank you for being part of the Global Coalition for Democracy. I agree with many of the speakers and what was said, particularly about. Can you, Lina, can you check your mic microphone? 
the sound isn't too clear. Can you check the microphone? Sure. First, unmute, unmute and unmute again. Yeah. Sure. Is it better now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. Well, I just was mentioning that I do agree with many speakers and what was said, uh, particularly about the challenges, many of which are linked to growing autocratization on the one hand and the loss of quality or erosion of democracy on the other. Just a quick reminder that number one, from democracy point of view, yesterday was not better in Asia and the Pacific. For the last 20 years, democracies have outnumbered uh, non-democratic regimes. Uh, and secondly, over the last five years, uh, not only retreats, but also progress towards democracy are found across Asia and the Pacific. And here I'm referring to International IDEA Global State of Democracy Indices and reports freshly launched the overall scores have improved in number of countries from Papua New Guinea to Nepal, Republic of Korea, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, and such improvements often go unnoticed. And thirdly, there are popular demands, protests we have seen Hong Kong, India, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, among other places. Uh, they are not muted, even in the face of often brutal use of force to repress them. At the same time, uh, no doubt, the challenges that were discussed are real. As mentioned, we saw the dramatic reversals in Myanmar, Afghanistan, and Hong Kong, and many more outside of Asia, to a point that question has been asked about, what is it about 21, 2021, and the coups and the sort of return of uh, traditional military takeover? Is it pandemic related in the sense that the whole world seems to be in influx and what is normal is sifting, or is it something to do with the uh, rising democratization clashing with uh, authoritarianism? Equally worrying is the erosion of democracy or what we can call killing democracy by thousand cuts phenomena. Significant declines recorded from Indonesia to Sri Lanka, India and the Philippines and I'm talking about democracies here. Attacks are made against separation of powers and fundamental rights in particular. To me, some of the biggest future worries lie, and number one, and here I agree with Yamini, the rising ethno-nationalism often fueled by religion, intensified xenophobia, exasperated by the stress of the pandemic, undermining pluralism and increasing polarization. For example, in Indonesia, freedom of religion is its all time low since 1975. Number two, the growing reliance on emergency legislation to deal with the pandemic gave a certain normalcy to harsh policy measures and reversing this normalcy and militarization, securitization of politics will require democratic uh, pushback. We are also confronted by the dilemma of renewed assertiveness of the state in good and in bad, including heightened expectations versus erosion of state resources in many places and consequences thereof. My final point about the partnerships and engaging with non-democracies. Um, and I agree that someone always needs to have an access and dialogue with the, with the autocrats or representatives of non-democracies. Contexts, of course, vary terribly much, uh, but it's important to do it in a way that does not render them legitimacy or in a way that engagement slowly transforms toward normalization or non-acceptable situation. The business as usual, what Edward mentioned. I liked what he said about the narrow, narrow corridor there. Authoritarian regimes and leaders are most certainly learning from each other, from surveillance technology to using gender quality as weapon in backsliding. And the democratic forces need to do the same. And we need coordinated solidarity uh, with opposition movements in repressive contexts through information sharing, uh, emergency funding, and so on. Uh, the actors on the ground, be it in Myanmar, Cambodia, Hong Kong, elsewhere, they're often exhausted by the tasks they have, 
competing media attention, keeping in touch with their constituencies, often fearing for their lives. This uh, may not be easy, but uh, try be must. And I think I leave it there and right. look forward to our discussion. Good. Thank you again Thank for you. the panelists. All right. Thank you very much, Lina. Uh, next, uh, Manpreet, uh, who is a regional director for Asia Pacific uh, National Democratic Institute. Uh, Manpreet, please. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Takasu. And uh, let me just say it's been a very uh, rich conversation already. And I have the um, perhaps one of the more difficult tasks of, of making sure I don't repeat what has already been said. And, and uh, and frankly, what I, I, I thought I'd do is just spend just a few minutes kind of teasing out some of the key takeaways from each of the speakers as they um, as they relate to the to the three themes that were discussed, um, as well as pose a couple of questions um, in between if this if the speakers are willing to take them on during the discussion period. But first on on the first theme on um, democracy in Asia Pacific challenges and prospects, um, I think one, one challenge that perhaps is, is more timely that hasn't been discussed and I'd be interested in, in people's views is, is the example of Afghanistan, where, um, you know, the, the example of Afghanistan, what has happened in the last few, few months, has really cast a doubt on those of us who have been working towards promotion of democracy, as it seems to be conflated with nation building. Um, and so how do we avoid this trap of, um, of, of making sure that conflation is, is not uh, taken away from the important work of, of democracy promotion? Um, secondly, there was a lot of conversation amongst the speakers about um, emboldenment of authoritarian leaders. Um, what I think hasn't been discussed as much is the learning that is actually taking place amongst authoritarian leaders. This is happening within borders, but importantly, across borders. Um, and in some cases, in very insidious ways and through the use of technology um, and sharing technology you know, to increase surveillance uh, or to otherwise take away from more fundamental uh, rights. Um, so I think this, this ability is one challenge to, to watch as well. And then finally, in terms of challenges, you know, so many of the issues that were discussed by the speakers, I think, boiled down to the issue of trust, uh, the, the, the trust or lack thereof between the citizenry um, and its leaders. And this relates to some of the issues that um, Ms. Iyer was talking about in terms of uh, disinformation, the, the role of big data, um, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability. Um, here, if I may just drill down to one of the things that Ms. Iyer mentioned around big data, um, because she used um, the example of India to, to discuss those themes, is, you know, might a solution actually lie within the problem? Uh, in that uh, India, for example, has done a lot of really innovative work on how to uh, manage big data in a way that doesn't run uh, crosswise with with uh, privacy concerns and other issues. So I think we have to try to be creative of trying to find solutions within the problems, if you will. In terms of prospects, um, you know, I think there's we we sometimes give short shrift to um, some of the uh, some of the reasons to be hopeful for democracy in the Asia Pacific region. We have seen um, uh, 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 an increase in civil movements from Hong Kong to India uh, to um, Thailand across, across the Asia Pacific region. And I think that speaks well for the power of democracy still resonating amongst large populations, regardless of where governments or leaders are actually taking the country. I think that's something to be hopeful for. Secondly, demographics may be on our side. So many countries have such a large youth population from Malaysia to India, so many parts of South Asia. Um, you know, this is where I think there's an opportunity that we need to seize, frankly, uh, uh, a window we need to seize to really harness that uh, energy from the youth to make sure that it's put forward to appropriate channels for political change around democracy. Um, and then finally, I think in terms of prospects, 
you know, speaking from the United States, we're on the on the cusp of going towards this summit for democracy. There is absolutely, as many speakers have, have talked about, a role for the United States and other traditional strongholds of democracy to play here and focusing on the Asia Pacific and, and focusing on democracy and human rights as the basis for foreign policy as the Biden administration has, has said um, they wish to do. So that's on the first theme. On the second theme about building democratic partnerships in the region, this is an area of work for NDI, um, actually in partnership with JCIE. Um, and it really does come down to a few different key elements. One is around building common values and norms. Uh, another is about how showing that democracy can deliver for its citizens, the, the power of democracy and actually delivering cit towards citizens' needs. And then also around creating solidarity uh, to making sure that it's, it, it's, it's kind of the best bulwark towards authoritarianism. Now here where Professor Ichihara and Professor Hunjun Kim, I think both mentioned using um, regional mechanisms uh, to be able to provide that bulwark and that solidarity. I guess my question to each of you would be, are the regional architectures that currently exist adequate and up to the task in the Asia Pacific region to actually take this on? I think uh, many would agree that there's been a bit of a mixed success, whether you're seeing ASEAN visa Myanmar, um, we're yet to see what the power of this quad might look like and whether it gets into these issues. So I think there's a real question mark about whether current regional mechanisms are actually up to the task of, of, of pursuing this. Um, one other key point on this theme, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Professor Hun about uh, this being pro, about being pro-democracy and not anti-China. Um, as someone who's been personally sanctioned by China, I can't emphasize this uh, enough, that this is about our values, not being against somebody else. Um, and so uh, showing solidarity around those common set of values, I think, is going to be uh, increasingly important. And then finally, on the, the, the last theme about engaging non-democratic countries, um, you know, this is, uh, this is an area, and, I, and both Professor Edna Ko as well as uh, Mr. Erwan spoke about this, um, you know, that, that this is not about uh, uh, cutting and splicing and saying whether the, you're a democratic country or a non-democratic country. There are democratic values and constituencies within all of, all of the countries of Asia Pacific. The question is, how do you build sol solidarity amongst them? How do you empower that um, uh, uh, to, to, try to try to shape change? Um, and I think there's a lot of work, um, good work uh, that can be done here, but it does get back to this point around um, uh, making sure that uh, we're not uh, cutting off uh, out of um, some high principled <laughs> rationale, um, you know, engagement uh, within certain political borders, just because the leaders have taken uh, an authoritarian turn. Um, it's a more nuanced view, it's a more complicated uh, way of engaging, but it's a necessary one to make sure that we empower those democratic actors even within those countries. Finally, just one quick word on the Summit for Democracy. Um, you know, I think this is not a moment in time. This is, this is a Summit for Democracy to remind democracies of the norms and the values, the reasons why democracy can, can deliver for its citizens, and a time to reinvest um, in those principles in a number of different ways, many of which have been discussed by the speakers here today. Um, so I see this as the beginning uh, of uh, a step change, I hope, um, in focusing in democracy, not a moment in time. I'll stop there. Thank you. Let's uh, open the floor. Uh, may I invite all the participants to use the reaction, raise your hands or reaction part, uh, you know, to put their hands like, like this, whatever. And uh, I'd like to, you know, the, well, make uh, the floor as many people as possible, so that uh, already we have uh, some question, a mandatory task question, and I will come back to that later. But uh, let me see, uh, can I recognize any hands raised? Uh, let me see, I'm trying to see. Uh, it's not so easy, there are so many participants. Uh, um, if uh, nobody's raising hand yet, I, I saw Ichal's face in the screen. Ichal? 
Are you with us? Yes, Ambassador. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah. Can you take floor uh, while I'm waiting for others? <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> just to speak out uh, what you're doing and then it, perhaps make a brief comment, please. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. A big good morning um, for friends. I'm enjoying and I've actually learned a lot uh, from the perspective of, of the academic um, uh, related to the topics. Uh, I have a few questions actually, but uh, first maybe I'd like to address these things because uh, from the civil society organizations in Asia, we are kind of like a struggling to really form formulate things or even preparing ourselves in terms of the what next and then what to do to responding all the challenges that we've been repeatedly discussed in many uh, forums, discussion or webinar. I think the most attention is um, at the moment of time is how we are uh, supporting or helping the struggle of the many civil society organizations in the frontliners. For instance, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Hong Kong, and many others, because ADN is an, on the tip of the issue, then we can feel actually how day-to-day -day, uh, real struggles with very less support of international communities. Um, since the battle is too, too huge, I guess this is, um, uh, we expecting uh, the, the manifestation or more support uh, in different sectors in order to addressing these issues. So I guess recently we just finishing our democratic assembly that come up with a, a few key strategy, how the civil society to confront the regressions or let's say, or to deepening democratic regressions. I think we, we will finalizing within these weeks. And then we also uh, would like to submit to the, the, uh, to the democratic, democratic summits that are happening uh, later this week. So I guess there's a few issues because civil society has been hearing a lot of the outcry about the challenges, different practices, different suffering. I think it's very important right now to step into the next levels, how to providing support uh, to, uh, uh, sorry, strategy first, uh, how the many civil society in the regional, national and subnational levels <laughs> to, start, to start responding um, um, to every challenges from different aspects. And then uh, secondly, uh, 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 sorry, uh, b before that, so we, we are really uh, trying to frame uh, our, uh, our pointers to navigating them. I think it's very important for, for them now to start uh, 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 putting the effort to confronting every challenges. Um, and then for maybe from the civil society organization itself, we also uh, would like to put in like a, what do you call it, like a positioning paper or document to the democratic uh, democracy summits that we hope at least three points. First is to try to be inclusive uh, and try to be practical because many of us are struggle with the many webinar, web, many discussions, many coalitions that actually is, is quite useful, but uh, we need something more concrete and inclusive, including the national and subnational engagement. Second is uh, to addressing the most concerns, which is uh, not, uh, I mean, like we thinking away uh, these democratic summits or other efforts to try to addressing the most concerns in Myanmar, Hong Kong, Afghanistan, and many other countries. And of course, the third, uh, increasing the democratic support. I guess Maiko Ichihara has addressing very good pointers that encouraging the Japanese governments and, and many other governments to start to step in. Do not be idols, because uh, it seems like uh, it's been quite lonely, you know, um, and I, 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 and I feel like there is there should be some things to increase in democratic support, and the rest is we are still encouraging many civil society, and we try to be, uh, build different sector to engage, connecting, and supporting each other. So I think the the most question right now for everybody who can respond is like uh, how actually we can translate this kind of the uh, this kind of discussions um, to increasing support. Uh, and how to connect things 
with the struggle of many civil society organization right. on the ground. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Ichal. This is a very important issue. I think uh, the many civil society organization, uh, you mentioned the civil society organization, but also media are really struggling and hard work and the civil, civic space is narrowing you know, very much. And I think one of the very concrete, uh, I think, uh, contribution Summit to Democracy could make is to change this, uh, you know, climate for that. So the, and one more question about, uh, Manfred raised the issue about uh, regional mechanism. Uh, the, do we have, uh, you know, this uh, working uh, regional mechanism already? Or do we need to create a new one or improve the existing mechanism? I think these are two perhaps uh, very important question. May I invite uh, our panelists or commentators to speak? Uh, Professor Hanjun, can you raise your nodding? So can you start first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that's a very important question about the regional mechanism. I think the, as the, the competition between uh, over the value between US China uh, deepens and then if the situation becomes more serious and then if the countries becomes more threatened and they have a higher heightened levels of a threat perception on the authoritarian challenges, I think it will eventually occur in the long term. But I think uh, uh, my understanding of the regional mechanism and why it's not uh, difficult, uh, although we have them, you know, in terms of the human rights commissions, they have a regional, uh, 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 regional organization. And then also in terms of the constitutional courts and then many lawyers and then the congressmen have their regional uh, associations. But I, I think the, the fundamental problem is that uh, the US's role in the region still is modeled after the hub and spoke model of uh, the alliance system, mainly is dealing with uh, Korea, dealing with Japan independently, dealing with ASEAN and dealing with uh, Australia. So I think that hub and, poke, uh, hub and spoke system, I think is uh, somewhat a hindrance to have a more about the Asian uh, initiative or the, uh, the ASEAN countries have their own initiative to build the regional institutions. At the same time, I think the China, of course, is uh, doing is all it can do to do this, uh, to do to to frustrate those kind of uh, uh, the efforts to build a kind of a unified voice in the region. So I think there are very diffi uh, dif uh, difficult situation, but I think as uh, the China, uh, and then the threat from Hong Kong, of course, was a really, really, it, it's the disastrous thing. But I think the, the problem is that the, the regional sensitivity has not been that heightened up at this point. But I think those kind of, as the time becomes more, as the time uh, passes, I think if that uh, situation changes, and then if the US also, with this time, kind of democracy summit, and I think more will come next year, which is in person and with a more uh, uh, small number of countries, I think we will have more concrete plan of the regional institutions. I, and I, know, I know that the, the foreign uh, um, uh, State Department people are uh, running uh, these days in the Asian countries to build upon that kind of regional uh, consensus or the kind of at least some agreement among uh, of the democracies and values and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for instance, Eduna, do you have any comment uh, to one of these questions, uh, either regionalism or support to civil society organizations? Well, actually, uh, my view there is I, I share a, a number of points with uh, Mr. Honjun Kim on uh, on the on the role of uh, I mean on, on uh, particularly on uh, regional mechanisms. But my view, in addition to that, is uh, democracy is promoted both at home as well as uh, but with the support outside. And no matter how good your regional mechanism is, if uh, there is no home-based democracy, it, it sounds very violent, democracy warriors or democracy promoters, then it doesn't hold water. I think I salute Hong Kong for exhibiting such uh, home-based uh, promotion of democracy and struggle for democracy. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, there, it looks like there's some more that uh, could be done to improve regional mechanisms of support. And I agree with Mr. Kim on saying uh, that uh, 
we probably, I, I've said it uh, in a way, we cannot draw a very strong line between democracy, uh, between democratic and non-democratic. Uh, there are various levels of voices that can be raised even among the so-called non-democratic because the forms of threats to democracy are changing and have changed. Uh, something which cannot be seen up front, like I would say access to natural resources, access to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, certain economic uh, indices or even uh, technology. I have some doubts though about the question of demographic. I think we have to look at it more thoroughly because young people come from various sectors and they are not a solid block. We can further look into how young people think in terms of democracy and how they can play this out. For the large part of them, uh, they are into a different modality of uh, participation. It's unusual and quite different from the way people of our age, the older people have defined democracy. And it's something that be, should be scrutinized, further studied, and should be databased. In my country, for example, young people, you cannot generally speak for all, but young people come from poorer sections, middle uh, income, and, the, and, and, and they vary in terms of their perspective on participation. They vary in terms of their understanding of democracy. Uh, okay. So I think that one has to be uh, re-examined as well. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, Aya, do you have any comment to this question? Any of these questions? Can I come in? Yamini, yeah, Yamini, yeah. You have any comment? I, one of these yeah. questions. Yeah. No, no, just just uh, two two very quick things. I think particularly on uh, the question of regional uh, for regionalism, regional fora. Um, I think these are really really crucial um, uh, and critical. And uh, if I think about uh, one of the biggest lacuna uh, in the South Asian region, for instance, is the complete breakdown of regional institutional platforms like the SARC um, that were critical to building bridges, both in terms of government to government, but also people to people contact within the region that enable um, effective governance. And, and the, this challenge is be becoming even more or, or, or even stronger owing to two factors. One, um, the increasing push towards nationalism and deglobalization. Uh, India, for instance, chose not to become an active participant in the RCEP, uh, the big trade agreement. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, sits to our peril. Uh, and we tend to conflate economic uh, cooperation with uh, some of the strategic challenges challenges that we face in the region, which is also why institutions like SARC have broken down and trade within the regions, uh, within the region has, has undermined. So I, I think that um, there's a really big uh, push, uh, and here is where civil society can play a role in demanding and enabling and, and pushing our governments to build these active platforms uh, and institutional uh, regional connectivity uh, in substantive ways, uh, absent which both our economy lies in peril, but also the spaces for in, for cooperation and dialogue and building a democratic, collective democratic future become closed off. So I see civil society as playing a crucial role. And there I do think it's, it is important to acknowledge and several speakers have done so, but from the perspective of India too, civil society or spaces for civil society to, uh, uh, to, to, to actively uh, function are increasingly getting closed off as democracy itself is becoming challenged. So we have a dual fight, both to ensure that civil society plays a role in the in global fora on you know, pushing for international dialogue and regionalism, but at the same time ensuring that we preserve space within our countries to ensure that civil society remains prevalent. And here, international cooperation plays a very important role. Good, thank you. These are two, cru two cru crucial questions. You know, the multilateralism and uh, and regionalism, how to cooperate in uh, each other, and the civil role of civil society. Uh, the Professor Ichihara, do you have a, the additional comment? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, on the multilateral front, um, well, um, I agree that. Well, I mean, 
example, there are regional mechanisms in Asia, but um, well, those who are not really functioning well um, for the protection of human rights and democracy. For example, I mean, we have as an intergovernmental commission for human rights, but uh, well, each member has veto power, so it's um, impossible to really protect, um, you know, function to protect human rights. We also have quadrilateral security dialogue, um, which um, has a shared value of democracy, but they do not have um, diff- uh, well, you know, mechanism to, with which to defend democracy and human rights. And so, um, and so we are uh, well, um, in need of regional mechanisms indeed. But well, at the same time, um, it does not mean that we don't have anything at all. Um, we do have um, Asia Democracy Network um, where um, Ichao has been you know, leading. And also we have like Asia Democracy Research Network, um, East Asia Forum, um, and so on. And all these are in the civil society sector. So this means that um, we have to incorporate um, civil society in the creation of regional mechanisms. And indeed, um, civil society sphere is the the place where um, they have momentum for the defense of democracy. And um, well, I I echo um, Professor Kim's point that um, you know the um, current um, you know regional mechanism in Asia is um, sort of corresponding to the hub and spoke. Um, you know, um, mechanism um, in the security sector. And so well, um, it's really um, Japan and South Korea, which have to take the leadership in creating those um, regional mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, Ketuk, uh, you, can you add uh, the, the briefly, please? Yes. Uh, uh, when you uh, asking whether uh, any, any regional mechanism, uh, I think uh, we should expand the conception of uh, mechanism uh, more than just state base uh, into uh, sectoral base and also forum base uh, today and tomorrow we are we are in Bali we are discussing about how to rejuvenate uh, ASEAN way uh, because ASEAN way was criticized a lot when when Myanmar uh, issues uh, uh, on, on the on the table uh, and when when Thailand has an issue and also the in, in Philippines and Philippines, we 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 got we got a problem. So uh, ASEAN response to that is 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 not sufficient from the perspective of participant attending our forum today. Uh, so we we have uh, beside uh, the the way of approaching uh, and rejuvenating uh, ASEAN and put a new perspective on what means sovereignty, what means in a non interference because non interference cannot be used to pretext. Of, of, of preventing uh, abuse or, uh, or, or uh, ma- making excuse for abuse of human rights, for example, that kind of discussion about how to rejuvenate of state-based uh, regionalism. Sectoral base, uh, we, we, we see a lot of uh, element of those um, uh, already developed. The, the forum base, which is one of the most potential to be supported and, and, and uh, well-grounded right now, we have a Bali Democracy Forum, for example, a forum among state, which is uh, now uh, at, uh, uh, entering the, the 14 years, yeah, uh, the 14 years, uh, and then it's it's engaging non-democracy from the beginning, and that question by many Western countries, uh, uh, why we are engaging the uh, uh, aspire democracy, we call it, because they they want to learn, uh, and and then we 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 need to be uh, cautious how far uh, that learning is is there. So okay. forum, uh, another forum is that we, we got uh, uh, now uh, 10 years already, Bali Civil Society and Media Forum. Uh, we criticizing a lot about uh, the question uh, about how democracy is not bringing uh, delivery. So our theme is about uh, social justice and economic justice. And the state actors forum discussing the same issues, how, how democracy bring humanity, how Civil, uh, uh, dem- uh, economic and social justice can be uh, discussed. It is rare uh, point and topic to be discussed among state actors, but we try to push uh, the, the end prop for them. Okay, good. Let's go to second round, but we have very little time left, unfortunately. Uh, may I invite uh, the Mr. The Shu Sakalai? Uh, he's a member of House of Representatives, uh, Constitutional Democratic Party. Uh, Sakurai Sensei Dozo. Hello. Um, maybe uh, I am the only the uh, politician uh, among the participants today, and so uh, I'd like to comment on about the uh, operation aspect of democracy. That means election. I just elected 
uh, one month ago. And uh, so democracy is very important and that's a universal value and uh, should be spread over all over the world. Uh, I totally agree, but uh, the election is not beautiful, not gentle, not um, something uh, high value, uh, but it's uh, more ferocious and uh, violent uh, stuff. So, and it's uh, reality of election is ju just fighting to take the power so the, uh, the government and the leading party try to keep uh, the power and they do uh, everything they can do. So it's the rule of um, election is very important. And sometimes the police uh, can judge fairly, sometimes it doesn't work. And so, uh, the operation is also very important. And if I think it's very difficult in looking at Cambodia five years ago, the uh, government and leading party destroyed the uh, largest opposition party. And uh, after that uh, election was held, but it's not, I think, fair. It's not fair election. So it, it's... Uh, kind of difficult to uh, discuss among the, the political science area, but the, the election operation and how to fear uh, operation is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comment from the panelists? Uh, uh, if uh, any, uh, Eduna, you are going to have a election, presidential election next year. Br very brief comment because of time. Please. <laughs> Uh, the 2022 election in the Philippines is a very interesting challenge for democracy uh, in more ways than one. Uh, it will be a test of uh, democratic uh, measure coming from the ground, from the citizens. And I think we observe that right now, that there are there is a swell of population that really shows keenness and interest to participate but it is also a test of how the rule of law, the interpretation of the rules and the laws could be uh, could serve uh, democracy or maybe diminish democracy in the way our institutions interpret the rules and the law. And therefore, this is where, again, at many layers and levels, election is truly a laboratory, a very good laboratory of democracy in the sense that you see warm bodies of people being engaged in it, but you also put to a test how rules, how uh, the laws are operationalized and interpreted, at least in our country. And therefore, at the moment, the entire country, 60 uh, million voters out of 100 million people are getting into the polls and each one and all the players, uh, I would say they pull each other. It's a tug of war. And this is really be going to be a test of democracy for the Philippines in 2022. Thank you. And uh, the consequence is going to be about what we have been talking about in the last hour or so. So it's crucial for a good democratic election to be held. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Nick, uh, you raised the hand uh, from CS, please. Oh, thank you, Ambassador Takasa. I know we're at the end of our time. I just uh, wanted to say I, I certainly appreciated the uh, comments emphasizing the importance of US leadership in the region and also multilateralism. Uh, but I just wanted to say that, that reflective of, of the region's diverse experience with democracy, approaches to enhancing uh, democratic uh, networks will also be diverse. So I don't think that bilateral alliances, uh, informal coordination and multilateralism are, are mutually exclusive. I think as this partnership evolves, it's gonna feature a variety of ways in which we uh, coordinate both our experiences and our approaches um, to democratic governance in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good point. Thank you very much. Well, 
time is running short. <laughs> and uh, among the panelists and commentator, if you have any desperate point that you want to make, uh, please feel free. But uh, otherwise, uh, I will, you know, go to this uh, concluding part. Uh, anybody want, really want to say desperate, you know? Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Then there's a few minutes left uh, to conclude. Uh, um, the, I will really be thank uh, very, you know, this rich discussion. And uh, there's no intention for me to summarize all discussions, rich discussion, it's impossible. But just focus on the last point of expectations. What do we make our recommendation to summit? Uh, I think a few points. I think, uh, first of all, the, what, how you do see current status and prospect. I think we have seen these real challenges to democracy from the economic monopoly, social fragmentations, big data, and so and so. And uh, really, Hi. we are worried about declining. Your voice is hard? Can you hear? Yes. Declining, uh, significant decline democracy. Uh, the fact of the matter is that only four countries for ASEAN are invited to summit for democracy. This is something I think uh, really symbolic, really. But at the same time, everybody spoke that uh, there is very vibrant civil power, although under difficulty, uh, working in many countries and work in progress. So we should not lose hope for this, I think. And having said that, I think, uh, first of all, I think a basic approach should not be against authoritarianism, but pro-democracy. Uh, I will not mention uh, against China. <laughs> this, but anyway, pro-democracy, I think we should move on. And enhance, there is, a, I think everybody agree, we have to strengthen democratic partnership and cooperation solidarity and uh, information sharing and coordination solidarity, all kinds of things at the government level, uh, level is regional, uh, the regionalism and there is need to look at uh, the view, current, uh, how to call this existing mechanism. And then uh, we are very much heartened to hear uh, there is a uh, you know, effort to be going to rejuvenize ASEAN way and uh, as a mechanism too. But also civil society organization. I think uh, it, it is a big area that we can strengthen the coordination. And in this context, I think it's important to have Asian ownership. I think uh, an inclusive process. And where we work for this social fabric to strengthen social fabric and also inclusive development. I think these are, I think, very good platform and climate change and pandemic. Those are common interest. I think uh, uh, the partnership could develop. And that's the second point is, I think important point is the role of CSO and also media, independent media, which are really difficult in the world, uh, in the working. And I think uh, this is very important to extend a stronger support and take advantage of summit. And then some specific uh, uh, recommendations made to Japan, probably uh, these are, I think, important uh, to, to make uh, appeal to the leadership role of Japan and the country like Korea, South Korea, and. Uh, uh, other countries in, 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 in this democracy in, in Asia to take leadership role, to review their, how to call this uh, approach and the mechanism to strengthen this uh, support to CSO and independent media. And, uh, and also I think uh, important thing is that we have to demonstrate that democracy can deliver better. And the, we can, that we should demonstrate how we can, how we call this democracy can work better. And uh, I think uh, uh, this is one, one, one point, I think, let me see. Is any point uh, I may have missed, but I think we should uh, limit uh, two or three point of important, uh, I think, uh, message. And if there is no strong, I think, uh, you know, resistance objection to this, uh, I will ask the secretary to summarize this and we have to send it to tomorrow to be included in the summit uh, in the democracy. Uh, I don't see any strong objection. So in Security Council, so decided. <laughs> so, that's the way <laughs> we are doing this. Um, anyway, uh, we just passed one minute. Uh, uh, unless uh, anybody wants to take floor at this moment, uh, we just want to thank uh, uh, for all panelists 
and commentators, and also participants, uh, despite all late hours or early morning, you are kind enough and generous enough to participate. And we look forward to another opportunity to deepen our cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, good night and good morning, good afternoon. Thank you. Anyway.